All right, we are going to concentrate here tonight. We already looked at verses 1 and 2 um, last week, and tonight we're going to look at verses 4 and 5 primarily, and verse 3 kind of serves as a connector. But in verses 4 and 5 we read the following, Do good, O Lord, to those who are good, and to those who are upright in their hearts. As for such as turn aside to their crooked ways, the Lord shall lead them away with the workers of iniquity. Peace be upon Israel. Well, you can look at this verse and you could probably come up with an outline pretty quick, right? The contrast uh, between two different ways is abundantly clear. You've got verse 4, which is all about those who are good. And then you've got verse 5, which is about those who are crooked. Now, verses 1 and 2 are significant when we talk about the idea of people being good and people being crooked uh, in this psalm because verses 1 and 2 talked about the steadfastness and the security that belongs to those who trust in the Lord using the geography around Israel, or around Jerusalem particularly. So tonight, what you have here are those who are good. And yet, the Bible says in Romans 3, there are none good, no, not one. So this passage says, no, there are. There are those who are good. And so we have to ask the question, well, how can this be? How can there be good people when the Bible says there are no good people? And the answer is pretty clear. The answer is that they trusted in the Lord first. That's verses 1 and 2. And because they put their trust in the Lord, the Bible tells us he makes us good when we do that. And isn't that how it happens at salvation? The moment that we're saved, the Lord makes us good. We're the upright. We're the righteous. He's given us his righteousness. He makes our lives good. And then it says that we become upright workers of righteousness. That's what it's telling us. But then you've got crooked people. These crooked people are workers of iniquity. So you've got upright workers of righteousness and then you've got crooked people, they're not straight, who are working iniquity. And the thing that connects all of this is verse 3. Verse 3 connects what we're, what we're talking about and trusting in the Lord and him being our, our steadfastness and our security in verses 1 and 2. And that bridge is going over to the elements that we see with the upright, upright and the crooked in verses 4 and 5. So let's look at verse 3 for a minute. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, lest the righteous reach out their hands to iniquity. So the idea here behind this verse is almost the exact same parallel we can find it in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. Do you see it? 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13 tells us that we have a way of escape when the temptation or the testing comes. Well, this verse is saying that the scepter of wickedness, it's not going to rest upon the land uh, that is allotted to the righteous. Why? Because then the righteous will reach out their hands toward iniquity. In other words, God is telling us that when we trust in him, and because of the fact that we struggle with wickedness every day, and we do, uh, he is going to provide with that temptation or that testing that we're facing the way of escape. Here in this passage, He's going to make sure that he is there for Israel, lest the righteous reach out their hands to iniquity. So verse 3 is a promise that's very similar to what we read in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. The wicked are never going to be completely or finally defeated, and, and are defeating, rather, the nation of Israel. They're never going to get the upper hand. But it also reminds us of what we have from the Lord today as well. We have the very same thing. We have the very same promise. And so when we read in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but will with the temptation also make the way of escape. It's so that we may be able to bear it. Why? Because we live in a wicked land. We live in a place where we're constantly being tested. And God is never going to bring us to the tipping point. And so God is always faithful. He says he preserves righteousness, even in the midst of our, 
uh, of our wicked society that's around us. And, and wickedness may surround us, and it may be even more intense because we live in California. We all have friends that are in the South or in the Midwest, and they're, they're praying that California will suffer a huge earthquake and will be tipped into the sea, you know, because they just view California as just being the epitome uh, of wickedness. And they think that the nation would be a lot better off without us. Well, you know, there, there's a problem there. And the problem is they don't see their own wickedness. Amen. It's just a difference in, in the way that it's being manifested. It's much more out in the open here, that's true. But the problems that, that are festering in the Midwest and in the South and in the East Coast, they're there and they're alive and they are eroding our nation as well. So what do we do with this contrast then? Well, let's just look at the way of the upright briefly, and then we'll look at the way of the crooked uh, after that. Now, when we're looking at the way of the upright, most of us are going to identify with that tonight, right? Because we know that we have the righteousness of Christ, that our sins are, are gone, that, that we've been forgiven. But then we have to go one step further and ask this question, what did I expect from the Lord today? Have you ever thought about that question? It's a good question to ask at the end of the day. What did I expect from the Lord today? Did I expect the grace and the strength to meet my trial there, like we sing in the hymn? I mean, did I really believe that he would give me what I needed or did I just kind of coast without him today? I believe right now that I am right with God. But as his child, am I taking what he has given me and 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 accepting this privilege, this invitation that he's given to me to, to take the way of escape, to take the opportunity to depend on him, to trust in him with all my heart and not lean on my own understanding? Or did I just go through my day doing what I thought was right or what I felt was right or what other people were telling me was right? That's a big difference. I think that most Christians that are living today don't take that opportunity. Don't take the privileges that they have because of the righteousness that has been gifted to them. You can't know that for sure, but you can tell by the way that they respond to things in life. They're just very, very anxious, very concerned, very, very absorbed in their own little world, and they're not caring for the people that are around them. I was talking to somebody, I had a counseling opportunity today. They had a great need, I had spent some time talking to them. It's just very hard to find people to meet those needs. You know what I mean? It's just, we've, we've got a, a situation where we, we're thinking only of ourselves. We gotta, we gotta get over that. We've got to bar start thinking outward. That keeps us from being so selfish and self-focused with, with our lives. So God is giving us the help that we need. That's why we're able to do all the good things that we do. That's why we're able to do all the right things that we do in life. It's because God is helping us. Now, the most upright person, just think about in our whole group here, who would be the godliest, most upright person here? You got that person in your mind? All right? So you're thinking, I'm it. No, you're not thinking that, right? <laughs> uh, you might be thinking about somebody that you admire or, or what they can do for the Lord and how de dedicated they are. But the most upright person among us this evening is, is as weak as all of us this evening. I mean, do you see that? Because if you think otherwise, then just get this down. If God leaves you to yourself, it won't take you very long to destroy yourself. And that, it doesn't matter who you are. That's what will happen. You say, how do you know that for sure? Well, I've got some examples. Hezekiah is a great example of this. You, you can't think of more glowing terms. I mean, you think about David, he's a, he's a man after God's own heart. But listen to what the scripture says about Hezekiah in 1 Kings chapter 18. It says this, Hezekiah trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah nor who were before him. Now, who was before him? I can think of David, right? Solomon? 
for he held fast to the Lord and he did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. The Lord was with him. He prospered wherever he went. That's what 1 Kings 18 verses 5 through 7 say about Hezekiah. That's an upright man. But then when we get to the latter part of his life, here's what we read in 2 Chronicles 32 and verse 31. However, regarding the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, whom they sent to Hezekiah to inquire about the wonder that was done in the land, God withdrew from him. God withdrew from Hezekiah in order to test him that he might know all that was in his heart. And, and you know the story, what was in Hezekiah's heart? Anybody know? Pride. And the pride was saying to the Babylonian ambassadors, come on in here and see what we have. And what, what ended up happening is they took inventory. And they knew exactly where they were going to go when they defeated Israel and they burned Jerusalem to the ground and they took everything that Hezekiah showed off in the temple of God. You say, what would cause a man to do that? Pride. Not the sense of humility that he had when the Lord said what he said about him in 1 Kings 18. You say, how could that happen? God withdrew. See, if you don't know that you're weak, there will be a time in your life when God will withdraw and then you'll find it out. You'll find it out real quick. And so I think that's what we're seeing. Abraham's another great example of this. Here's a man who epitomized faith. The New Testament is very clear about this. Romans 4, Hebrews 11, Abraham's life, so much of it in the book of Genesis. One of the great four men in the latter half of the book. And so when you read about him, you're thinking always in positive glowing terms, but what did he do concerning his wife because of his insecurity and lack of faith? He lied. He lied and said, my, that's not my wife, that's my sister. Even to the point where these heathen leaders were, were taking Sarah to be their own wives. I mean, you say, how could a man get to that point? Well, all it takes is for God to withdraw himself. His son Isaac, did he do the same thing? He did the exact same thing. Now, we do good, O oh Lord, to those who are good, uh, to those who are of our right, uh, upright in their hearts. So if God doesn't do good, this is the point that I'm making here. If God doesn't do good in me, then I cannot be good or do good myself. That's the point. And so our dependence needs to constantly be upon him. One of my favorite verses in all the Bible, uh, probably my life verse, if you could, you know, have one, is Psalm 84, 11. Because of that goodness of the Lord that's constantly coming into my life, flowing into my life. For the Lord our God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. He's a giver. He gives grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Yeah, we, we serve a great God. So even in our difficulties, we find God's opportunities. Think about that. In our difficulties, we find God's opportunities to show his goodness and his benevolent, benevolence toward us. But then there is the way of the wicked. The way of the wicked. These are people who willfully turn aside, the Bible says, and then they are thus led away with the workers of iniquity by the Lord himself. They knew the way of righteousness, the Bible says. They knew it. But they chose the way of wickedness. And so the Lord led them away with the workers of iniquity. You say, well, were they children of God? No. They were children of iniquity. They were children of wrath. We know this because the Lord tells us that they were. This is like what Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21. He said, it would have been better for them to have not known the way of righteousness, then having known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. We see this in Israel. We see this in Christianity today. People who are pretenders. People who know, but they don't really know. I mean, they know in a, in a very uh, objective way, but they don't have a relationship with God. They know objective things about God, surprising amounts of information but they turn aside they're apostates they leave God and because of that God leaves them after he leads them into the way 
of the wicked. We, we have peace, though, with God because the Bible tells us very clearly that we have it. We have peace with him just as Israel had peace. We have peace with him because of our Lord Jesus Christ. The way of peace they have not known, Isaiah said in Isaiah 59 and verse 8. And there is no justice in their ways. They have made themselves crooked paths. Whoever takes that way shall not know peace, Isaiah 59 and verse 8. So you say, well, what do I learn from that? What I learn is if I choose to turn aside to my own crooked way, I won't have the peace of God within me. And it may be evidence of the fact that I'm not his. You say, how can, how can you say that? I can only say it about me. I can't say it about you. But I can say that there's a strong warning for all of us here. God can winnow through all of the pretenders and he knows the difference. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. If we are depending on him, then the peace and the stability that we need in the present will be there. We just trust in him. And the security that we need for the future, that will be there as well. It's enduring as verses 1 and 2 say. And we can trust in him. We won't be taking the way of the wicked. So let's wrap this up. If you have upright character, then what needs to happen in your life? Well, you need to produce a righteous lifestyle. You need to have an upright lifestyle. So that means only those who are upright may expect good from the Lord. You say, well, do, do, uh, do unbelieving people do good things? Well, they do. They do good things. But the expectation and the prayer, uh, all of that is missing. And I think that that is missing in the life of a believer sometimes. We don't have this expectation that God is going to move. We don't pray because we no longer believe. And that's when we face the danger of turning aside to our crooked ways. And the Bible is telling us that as an observer, all we can say when we see that happening in our own lives, when we see that happening in the lives of the people around us, all we can say is, it reveals something about the inner man of that person. The interior of that person. There's something wrong and it's a strong warning for that person. Because if we're living with the way, way, way of iniquity and the way of the uh, wicked, if we're living in that way and we're going on for a time in that way, right, and that's not leading to chastening, then the Bible's pretty clear. We're not believers. Okay? And there's a big, big problem. If you're, if you're not, you're going to be led away by the Lord himself in, in with the workers of iniquity. And pretty soon before you know it, spiritual things won't matter to you anymore. Secondly, if you have upright character, you're going to have many turning points throughout a week. I don't know about you, but I have turning points multiple times throughout the day. Constantly getting my head right and my heart right with God. What are those turning points called in the Bible? They're called repentance. We turn away from poor thinking, from poor decision making, and we start depending upon the Lord again. We're constantly doing this. That's a good sign. You turn aside from sin to, to righteousness and to this idea of sanctifying repentance. Anybody that teaches a believer that there shouldn't be ongoing repentance in that believer's life, that person is a heretic. Amen. There is something wrong with them. They're not teaching the truth of Scripture. Ongoing repentance, what does it do for us? It, re it restores joy. It restores hope in the life of a believer. We're recognizing wrong and we're bringing it out there. We're putting it on the table before the Lord and saying, Lord, this isn't right about me. I've got to change. Please help me change. And we ask God, God, may we be faithful when it comes to this. Help us to do the right thing. And the Bible tells us that he will do good in us. He will do good for those who are good. And I don't know about you, but I'm good. I'm good only because of Christ and his righteousness in me. And the fact that all of my sin, past, present, and future, is under his blood. Let's pray together.